Good morning. I like to joke that I came to my first DevOps conference by accident. And it was actually this conference. I, I'm from the ITSM world, really. I'm a, I'm a product manager for one of the big ITSM vendors. I work on one of the big name products. And back in 2015, or probably late 2014, I was hunting around for interesting looking conferences and stumbled upon one I'd never heard of before called Configuration Management Camp. Now, at first, when I signed up, I must admit, I hadn't really read the description, and, and, and configuration management is one of those terms which can mean different things in different communities. So we all know what it means here. But coming from that kind of ITIL, ITSM world, configuration management is often the realm of some poor person whose job it is to put together the CMDB and hurdle the cats and get all the data together for that. So it's not disconnected, but it's a bit of a different meaning. Fortunately, I had realized my error within about five minutes of signing up. But actually for me, with a, a role that involved things like IT asset management in our products, I thought I'd come and give this a look because even though I worked with very large enterprises, I was starting to become aware that a lot of those companies started to have very emergent teams doing DevOps, doing software-defined infrastructure, often a little bit under the radar, operating as startups within those companies and, and generally just trying to move things forward in a way that perhaps the rest of their enterprises didn't do. And it was brilliant. It was one of the best decisions I'd ever made was, was to make that journey. And it, it sort of embarked me on a, on a journey of working much more extensively with the DevOps community. It's been great fun. And actually, one of my favorite quotes about the whole topic of you know, the, the new ways of working, the new technologies in enterprises came at that conference. Um, Luke Kniez was here. I'm not sure if anybody remembers. There was a panel discussion. And at one point, Luke kind of stopped the panel discussion because I think there'd been a little bit of a, a conversation about enterprises being slow and, and dumb. And to be honest, enterprises have the capability of being slow and dumb, and I do see it a lot, but, but they also are generally pretty scared of breaking things. They generally have a lot of users on a lot of existing systems and a lot to lose. And although we all kind of know that the state of DevOps report and, and all the things that you're achieving as a community are showing that actually there's a better way of doing things than many of those old waterfall enterprise practices, they're kind of slow because in some ways they feel they have to be. But that's now what, four years ago, this is now my fifth conference here, which is, it's been a really amazing thing actually. I love coming here. I learn so much every time I come here. But in the meantime, I've also been going to DevOps days and DevOps enterprise. And one, one thing that's happened since 2015 that I've observed is, is back then I was talking mostly to people from startups and some sort of big unicorn companies. I, I don't know if there's anyone from Spotify here. I remember having a, a long and rambling and great conversation with the Spotify team who'd come over. But nowadays, when we see, for example, a selection of the speakers from the DevOps enterprise summits last year, and generally the speakers were passionate and talented DevOps people, but they're working in this kind of company. And that's really my customers. You know, the, these, are the, 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 these correlate pretty closely with the kind of companies we work with, you know, large banks, large telcos, aeroplane companies. And part of the challenge for them is when they're sort of embarking on these new patterns of, of working with new technologies, it's not quite as simple. I mean, the, the, the companies on the left here, and, and most of your organizations, if you're in smaller companies, you've been achieving amazing things, often with the benefit of having a kind of a bit of a green field to build on. Whereas when you're one of these companies, it's never quite that simple. You know, when, when the customer does something and something's going wrong, I thought Charity Major's talk yesterday was really fascinating, the way it drilled into all these unpredictable, complex things that can go wrong across a very, very complex distributed system. And a good analogy, I think, is I'm sure we've all done this. We've all selected the airline seat. I'm the kind of person who's a little bit focused on what airline seat I'm in, because if you're sitting in front of me, I'd like you to be able to recline. And, and of course, when we click that button, 
As a user, that's really easy, one click, but what we're actually interacting with behind the scenes are probably 50 different systems. And some of them are probably state-of-the-art, brand new stack, you're running in microservices, running in containers, running very dynamically. Others are probably ancient old systems running in a dusty mainframe somewhere that power the travel industry. <laughs> and that in itself is a big challenge because when we take what you do and we apply it to that, generally the, the DevOps teams, the software-defined infrastructure teams are the ones really pushing things forward. But you're part of this picture. So. One thing that enterprises have done well over the last 20 years, and this kind of is in my domain, is, is they've generally built pretty sophisticated frontline service organizations for their users, whether that's external customers or internal users. Nobody really comes to us nowadays to buy a basic service desk tool. They come to buy self-service tools for users. They, they come to buy cognitive powered, this is what they're all asking for, you know, cognitive powered tooling that will take away a lot of the toil from that process and provide a very, very effective frontline customer service tool. That kind of thing has been maturing, building out, it's kind of where I work. But the service desk teams in those companies where you have these DevOps teams emerging, growing, they find some interesting challenges too. It's not atypical for me to find that a service desk is sort of has been established with its practices for decades and suddenly finds new things appearing and the first time it knows about a new application is when they start taking customer calls there's this sort of general conflict with change management that's always you know the the, the change advisory board i think is always a bit of a sort of bugbear in the in the image of ITSM when when looking from the outside possibly deservedly but you know a lot of those teams have got to adapt in banks, they, they worry about their, the broad regulation challenges they have. So even if you're doing things well and breaking things less, which generally you are, it's an interesting challenge slotting that into the existing structures. We even you know, have you know, these new patterns like the fact that you know, we, I, I work with a product called Remedy. There's lots of products like ServiceNow and the like on the market where they are concentrated in the support centers. But as developers and infrastructure people, nine times out of 10, we find people are using Jira. So even then, the, even the tooling isn't quite connected. And we've had to think about how we make that flow work around the processes. And actually, just a few of these organizations have usually encountered quite so much of their technology being pushed to the front line. One of my favorite examples is Domino's Pizza in the UK, who seven, eight years ago had 30% digital sales and now have 80%. And they've had to transform completely around moving from a company you phone or a company you walk into to a company you order on online. So that's been interesting, but at the same time, I've been going to these DevOps conferences, I've been coming here, I've been talking to people, at, you know, I've been talking to people here now for five years, and, and increasingly, one of the challenges that I find people are facing in this world is, is that scale. As you grow in a large company, you might move from a small number of users to many thousands, to hundreds of thousands, to millions potentially. So you can't really be in the direct line of the customer support channel. And in a big company, DevOps teams have to then use that scaled support structure and work better with it. And of course, there's, a, there's new challenges like developers being put on call, but especially a word that always seems to come out of the conversations I've, especially some I've had here, is context. If you're paged at five in the morning and something's going wrong, if it's within the bounds of your own system, and, and clearly so, maybe that's not such a big problem, but remember that picture, that was a real discovery data picture of a real enterprise service. Something's going wrong somewhere. If you don't have that, that roadmap to start with, that's a problem, and again, Service management's quite good at putting those things together. Finally, when you scale up, you might find that your work queue has got you know, 50 development backlog tasks in it, but suddenly it's got 50 issues as well. And without a direct connection to the customer, at least the context of the customer, it's very, very hard to know what to prioritize. And as I say, these are things that have come of real conversations year after year, more and more. 
So I think there is a role for my realm. I, I think we've probably not, as, as, a, as a community, service management kind of didn't get DevOps. It's catching up very quickly. But, and I would sort of even point out that if we look at the state of DevOps report last year, as of course every CIO is doing, this, this gets a lot of attention. Even in the, that elite bracket that Nicole and the team identified, that top seven or eight percent, even then there is a significant amount of time that's dedicated to reactive support work, whether it's customer support or defects that come in. So again, having a scaled service channel and being able to work with it properly, well, my view is that's a way of actually letting you do more of that top bit. And that's the stuff where you're really changing the world. But that's all very well. Unfortunately, the reality is when you collide with the, the, the ITSM world, what you tend to find is something that looks like that, this, like this, this sort of classic tiered support structure. This is common across customer service industries the world over. This isn't just an IT thing. And at the top there is our sophisticated, scaled technical support channel. We do a pretty good job of that, I think. But then we have this kind of paradigm that if they can't fix something, so if the customer hasn't been able to help themselves through self-service, or if the frontline service desk doesn't know the answer, we have a, an escalation. And that'll typically go to level two. And you know, level two historically have been the people with the Microsoft certificates who've, come, who've done really well on first line, and they've been promoted up to a, a more specialist role. So they'll have a crack at it. Then maybe eventually it'll end up with product line specialists. And usually when, when developers, when infrastructure people get brought into these structures, that's where you find yourself. So it's not a perfect system. And when we looked into this extensively in our own customer support, it seemed pretty obvious that we were, we were struggling to get the answers quickly enough. You know, frequently we'd have this, sort of, this, this blockage and then maybe another one before we got through to the people who actually knew the answer. As one of, us, one of our senior support people put it, we're putting our best people at the back of a process. Another big problem is the ticket tennis situation, and this, this just happens all the time. The first line, they don't have that much experience comparatively. They don't always know just what to ask, so ticket gets raised, goes to second line, missing 50% of the information they need, no context, back it goes. This is also a really good way of burning people out because without necessarily having great knowledge of who's who, what tends to happen is that those upper tiers find the people they know are going to fix the thing every time. And I don't know if, we've, if you've met them. I've, always, I've met these people from time to time through my career. They've usually paid off their mortgage because they do lots of overtime. And they usually look a bit ill because they're breaking themselves. They're there every weekend. They're, they're the go-to person who can fix the database. They can fix the server. They're brilliant, but they're also someone who should probably be, build, should probably be building something because if they're that good, we can really use those talents. When I talk about this at ITSM conferences and when I talk about DevOps in general, I like to use this slide. And I like to explain you know, the concept of the Andon cord, this, this idea that you know, in, in, in the lean production methods which underpin DevOps, everyone's got that ability to effectively stop the line if people are, if, if people are doing something a bit dumb. I also like the point that I read somewhere that when they tried this in in some countries outside Japan, people wouldn't pull it because they thought they were going to be fired. I think that's another conversation, but it, it's an interesting problem. But what we've just described, you know, it seems to me pretty counter to a lot of the things that you've, as a community, adopted to do things better. You know, DevOps is built on lean. It's built on removing block blockages of work in progress activity. It's built on, literally built on bringing together two slightly diverse roles and making them talk to each other better, isn't it? Let's face it, the development and operations thing couldn't be more clear. So we move away from that single role thing. There's more talk about individual burnout and, and care for yourself at these conferences than at just about any other discipline I know of in development, uh, in IT. So that's a really positive thing for this community. But of course, what we've just shown is this, you know, that tiered structure is a really great way of doing the opposite. 
And also, just by putting people in, in vertical silos and horizontal silos, we never really disseminate that knowledge. So what we've got here is effectively a structure for formally implementing all those anti-patterns that the DevOps community has fought so hard to get rid of. And, and that is a problem. Fortunately, there are some of us sort of thinking a little differently and thinking of ways we can change some of these very deeply established paradigms and make things work a little better for ourselves. And we, there is an organization called the Consortium for Service Innovation. They are practitioners. They're people from our company, from lots of other big companies who have worked in this area for a long time. And they really do two different things. They, they've, they've put together a knowledge management framework called KCS, Knowledge Centered Service, which is great and worth a look, but it's for another conversation. But also they've encapsulated this idea called swarming. Um, they, theirs is called intelligent swarming, and I'll talk about why the intelligent matters a little bit later. But in a sense, it's just about throwing out to some or all extent the idea of having tiered support and just building something much more networky and more dynamic. So I thought one of the best ways I could do it is just illust illust one of the best ways I could illustrate this is by talking about what we do at my own company. We're of course just a large software vendor. We have some old practices, some new practices, some very new software, some extremely old software because we work with mainframes as well. Um, but essentially we we're a company of about 6,000 employees with a big global customer network. And, and as a result, we've got a very globalized support structure with about 500 people working in it. Now, a few years ago, now about five, six years ago, in fact, some of the support teams decided that they wanted to tackle what they felt were deficiencies in their, in their results. They, they felt the, the mean time resolu to resolution was improvable from where we were and customer satisfaction, where we're all targeted on customer satisfaction. So what came out of that practice, what came out of that research was, was essentially three broad types of swarm that we use instead of a lot of these tiered structures. And the first one, I mean, by the way, we still try and fix a lot of stuff right at the front line. This applies to anything else that comes in. And the first one is just what we call severity one. This is when something's genuinely on fire. We have some coordinators on, on call out. They get paged. We get everybody who needs to be got into the room into the room. And their main focus is just get it sorted. This is nothing new. Everybody does this. They don't all call it swarming. The novelty really isn't here. Where the novelty is, is actually in the next thing I'm going to talk about, which is the dispatch swarm. And this explicitly replaces the idea of having a level one, level two escalation path. So what this team does, they normally solve about a third of the, other, the, the issues that have come their way. And they're actually meeting just constantly, probably every hour, watching what's come in. And, and they'll cherry pick. If there's something that can just be fixed, they'll fix it. If they need to quickly get the customer on the line to clarify something, they'll do that. So their main objective is twofold. It's, it's to opportunistically fix anything that, regardless of whether it might previously have been categorized as quite low priority, if it's a five minute job, let's just do it instead of it going into a queue. Secondly, they're also able to validate tickets that are gonna go further, make sure that those, those incidents, those, those issues, customer requests have got the right information on so they don't come bouncing back. And importantly, what we do is I think a little akin to pair programming. We'll bring together a more experienced agent and put them with someone new. And of course, the idea then is you get that constant dissemination of experience and information, and it brings people up to speed more quickly. So that's, that's a pretty important part of the practice. But of course, still, because we're a product specialist company, we do have a lot of things go to teams of developers, go to teams of, of engineers. We, we, we run on-premise software, we have SaaS software. We, we, there's lots of different ways things can, can break, of course. So some of those things go to product line teams, and those product line teams are based around the world. And a lot of the time, they'll just be able to fix their own stuff. So we don't worry about calling that swarming. But, but what often happens in this kind of structure is that, let's say we need to talk to a DBA, a networks person, 
a developer, maybe someone from an external third party. Traditionally, and this is probably reinforced both by established practice in ITSM and also the tools, those things would get point assigned. They'd always be assigned to an individual, assigned to a team, so they'll bounce and bounce and bounce and bounce. A, a very common customization on ITSM tools is to implement a counter so that when something has bounced a certain number of times, someone puts a stop to it and gets everyone in a room. So effectively what we do is we get people in the room at the beginning of the process, not the end, with what's called backlog swarms. And, and this is just, you're not allowed to reassign to somebody else in this. If, you, if you've picked up that ticket and you need other people, you get together and you work it out. And we'll use things like chat ops for that, you know, Skype. We, we, we have Skype throughout the company, so frequently it's that. Slack bubbles up, of course, because it always does. So the backlog swarm, well, this varies in, incredibly by team. Uh, this is very self-organizing. Every team is able to do, do this in the way that they feel suits them. But a typical situation with the, the server team that, that works on my product is they have three different sessions a day for about an hour in each time zone, so quite frequent. And in those sessions, if they have something to bring, they'll, they'll give a swarm lead a little heads up an hour before. They'll make sure if people can be there, they will. And it's just, it's just a drop-in section. They'll, they'll spend an hour just working through these issues. And what, what's really good about this is people often drop in when, they're not, when they don't have anything to bring or they're not been in, they've not been asked to come. So I have a kind of standing invite and I like listening into these because people really engage with this. And I think the reason for that is, firstly, they're very strongly encouraged to. It's very much part of the way their team operates. But secondly, they learn. They learn too. And this brings together whoever you need and, and just replaces those, those assignments. Now, to make these things work, we had to change quite a lot of these old established practices, so it needed a lot of support from our senior executives in this world. Because, for a start, the teams had to do this with a lot of autonomy. Uh, again, very much in common with the DevOps world, I think if this is driven from the top, it doesn't really work. If each team adapts their process to their product, their customers, they have a lot of autonomy. Some of them even call things different names. There's about three different names for dispatch swarm working at BMC. So be it. But it also meant people had to let go of measurements and metrics. A support organization often has very individualized metrics on who's doing what. They're obsessed by the fix rate of each person. When you've got eight different people involved, how do you pin it to one person? How do you quantify that? And so there had to be a kind of letting go of trend information. For a lot of people, it actually meant for the first time they were much more in contact with the users, with the customers. And, and these customers, in this case, are our external buyers, the, the, the representatives who administer our systems at their, own, at their own companies. So it just needed you know, a little bit of, of soft touch with people to make sure they, they were mentored if they felt uncomfortable in that customer-facing situation. You know, bear in mind, in a support situation, you know, you're not always dealing with people who are 100% happy with you. We explicitly banned that ticket tennis. You cannot just bounce tickets around the organization. It does not help. Every time they land in a queue, they wait. So you're just bringing in multiple work in progress queuing steps. And we even thought about the tooling. Uh, mobile has been quite popular. People can get involved on Skype or whatever when they're on the road, when they're on the train. So it's, it's been pretty interesting. In the first couple of years, we had some great results. And the good thing was they weren't just results on the, the obviously measurable things, like mean time to resolution. They, they were good people results as well. So obviously, an, up, an uptick in customer satisfaction is very important for us. But we found that people were getting up to speed much more quickly. They were, they were becoming fully capable, contributing members of that support organization in half the time. And another really good thing that came out of this was actually it saved people a lot of the time. It reduces and reducing a lot of the toil works in support too. They, they can build new innovative ways of providing support. So that, that was great. And, and a couple of quotes I have here from our people. You know, the first, it's quite a lengthy quote, but a pretty experienced person. And, and I like this because he talked about the double benefit of bringing together people. You, you, if you have a complex problem and you bring together maybe eight people, you've got much more chance of finding someone who's seen that problem before. But if they haven't seen that problem before, if nobody in the room has, 
you're still combining the experience of different troubleshooting people. You know, they, that troubleshooting is a skill. I'm sure anyone who's done debugging knows troubleshooting is a skill. And it's a skill that different people have in different ways, and combining that can be really powerful. And then my favorite quote of all, this is the first person I ever spoke to about swarming. He's based in the UK, and he's been around the Remedy product line forever, a little like me. Um, so I, I wouldn't have thought there was a lot for Paul to learn. And yet he told me that he, just, he doubled his knowledge in a very, very short time once we implemented this. You know, one of our most experienced people gained so much from this that he felt his knowledge had doubled. So that's us. I mean, we, we've seen this now emerging in other companies as well. It, it's still emergent. This, this, you know, it's very hard to break these traditions of having tiered support and overcome all the management doubts and overcome the people's doubts. But this is quite a nice example I saw quite recently from a customer of ours who's a telco. And, and this is one of their operations in South America where they have a, a pretty standard service desk doing chat-based support for customers. Now, because that service desk, you know, what they'll typically, because they're using chat, they'll typically have you know, one or two different conversations running simultaneously. And what they've been given is the ability to put things on hold, just for a short while. You, know, you can have about three minutes. Tell that customer you'll be back in three minutes. Three minutes is just about enough not to lose them from that chat. And in that three minutes, they have the ability to just drop into some predefined rooms. I think they use MS Teams for this. I mean, obviously, Slack would work very well this way as well. So they will have some subject matter people on rotation just sitting in this chat room ready to assist the service desk people for up to three minutes. And by doing that, they've substantially increased the results on that service desk. What's the alternative? Service desk can't answer it. It would get created as a ticket. It would be dropped in a queue. It would muster and linger there for days. So again, it gives that very, very rapid response opportunistically when you know, to give you the chance of fixing things that wouldn't be immediately fixed. Another good example, and this is much more explicitly focused in the kind of DevOps world. I've been having some great conversations with this developer called Chad Jolly at Ford. And Chad works in the connected cars division, which is very much in the ascendancy at Ford, I think. You know, observing from the outside, we've seen one of their senior execs become CIO. They're, they're very becoming very, very important. And one of the reasons they're become, becoming very important is, you know, unlike my Ford, which is 20 years old and still of an age where if it breaks, I just hit it until it works again, they're now moving to having this connected technology in every single vehicle they sell. So they're going from a couple of hundred thousand vehicles to six million. And they're going from a few million devices to 180 million every year. Because a car is complicated now. And of course, they're not really getting that level of scaling in their support organization, so they had to adapt their ways of working. And, and one, of the reason, one of the main ways they did that was by adopting swarming. So they use teams on, uh, uh, you know, swarms built of people on rotation. Each technical team has one person whose job it is to go to the swarm that day. And again, it just pulls the whole support organization or representatives of it together into one place. And then they can scale it up, scale it down. If, if people aren't needed, they can drop. If, if they need to get in a third party like Amazon, they can do that. <coughs> so the message from this really, we, we feel, in addition to just making us work better as a support organization, what we're observing is that this is a much, much better fit to the world of DevOps, to the world of agile infrastructure, to the practices that have kind of made your world very successful in a very short time. Because it's built on autonomy, it's built on you know, collaboration and skills transfer and knowledge development and even some of the tooling, you know, that you don't see a lot of stuff being stacked into queues or, or email inboxes when, you know, whenever I go and visit teams involved in DevOps type practices, there's always Slack fired up and there's always, you know, that kind of chat ops. So we're investing a lot actually in chat ops. So it stops those queues building up and it, it also protects those individuals. I can't pretend we don't hear negative things still. I mean, like, like everything, there's no, there's no magic solution. And, and these are some of the problems that I've been speaking about even in the last year with some companies who've been attempting to adopt this. One of them is this perception that the costs increase when you do this. You, you're kind of buying that 
faster response, but at a financial cost. I, I'm a little wary of this thinking. I, I think part of it comes from the, the idea that you know, an hour of a service desk person's time is worth a certain amount, and an hour of a second line person is worth a certain amount. In ITSM, you often see financial numbers put on a first time fix. You know, a benchmark is that that costs you $20. Second line might cost you $80. If it goes to the third line, it might be $500. And so people feel by bringing the third line in quickly, they're immediately triggering that $500. And, and I think probably that's, my feeling is that's a little simplistic. It's a bit wrong-headed because ultimately what we're trying to do is, is, is not necessarily take up you know, valuable people's time, but actually create less, less strain on their time. So, I, I'm, I'm working on this. I'm interested in how much of this is perception versus reality. Another one is, is that question, how do we evaluate individuals? Again, I've, I've got a problem with that because every time I go and sit in a service desk, regardless of whether those people are measured as individuals, they're all typing away to each other on a chat tool. In fact, one of my favorite my favorite moments ever going out with a, with a UX designer and looking at a service desk was he was able to say, this person here is the most experienced. Okay, so, okay, Brian, why is that? He said, because there are chair tracks in the carpet to their desk. And that's just people constantly tapping them on the shoulder. What was quite scary was that service desk was supporting children's hospitals in London. So there was a lot of pressure on that person. But again, what are you measuring? It, it, if, if there's constantly teamwork going on, whether you've accounted for it or not, is it really a fair measurement to measure individuals anyway? We do see some challenges across time zones. I mean, this is an old problem with support anyway, but you know, it can be as simple as the fact that at six o'clock people want to go home. And so we've had to, even, you know, even ourselves, we've had to figure out ways of just making sure a handover between two people is a lot easier than a handover between two groups, essentially. So it's an interesting little challenge to think about. Swarming is a very human thing. When you have a group conversation, there can be the problem of individuals dominating that conversation. Again, that's something to be accounted for and worked on. I don't think there's any single solution to that. And then finally, and I mentioned earlier, I talk about why the consortium call it intelligence swarming. A simple challenge is in a big enterprise, who the hell do I bring into this conversation? If you ever started in a new company, I'm sure you will have, and tried to figure out who's who. Well, in a, in a big, big global enterprise, that's daily life for the support people. Who, who on earth supports this service? And when, when DevOps comes along with very much more agile team structures and new products and new services, that just gets worse. So the Consortium for Service Innovation describes intelligence swarming as, as, as a way of assisting with that decision. Who do I work with? I don't fully agree with their proposed methods, which is based on skills, surveys, and profiles, and I don't know, I, I did some work with project management software 20 years ago, which has put me right off skills, surveys, and profiles. So we're actually looking at whether we can work with some machine learning tools to figure out better ways of doing that. Uh, but yeah, that, so that's a bit of an open question, but it's definitely a, a, definitely a real challenge. Who do I work with? So we thought we'd actually have some further fun. We, we've got a lot of interest and a, a lot of you know, the DevOps community has really embraced this, this conversation. I, I was presenting at DevOps Enterprise last year in Vegas because Gene Kim has latched onto it. And, and we've, I've done probably a dozen DevOps days now. It, it's an interesting conversation topic because I can throw this into an ITSM conference or a DevOps conference called for papers with a pretty good success rate. And so there's, there's a lot of cross-functional interest, which is a bit of a first. We've been having some fun as well, seeing how far we can, you know, how, how much we can apply this to some of the, the other emergent concepts that are proving, I think, important across those, those areas, across service management, across DevOps. And, and one, one thing that I think is particularly interesting is, is Dave Snowden's framework, Kinevin. Has anyone encountered Kinevin? It's an interesting show of hands on this one. I see a few hands. K Kinevin. I, I can't do it justice like Dave can, and I've, I'm, I've tweeted a link to, a, to his website already. Um, but effectively, Kenevan is based in, uh, it, it, the word means habitat in Welsh. 
Dave came up with this structure, and it, it, it's based on the theory of complexity, effectively. The fact that complex systems fail in complex ways, and we need to have a different way of responding to problems based on, how, based on the nature of those problems, how, how complex they are. Again, fits very well with that talk from Charity yesterday, I think. So simplistically, can Evan puts any given issue into a domain, and, and the four main domains are, 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 are written up here. So an obvious problem or a complicated problem, they, they share something in common, and that's the fact that there's an easily defined cause and effect. When that cause happens, that effect happens. In obvious terms, it's obvious. You know, it's very, very clear, the cause to the effect. Complicated issues have that relationship, but they're harder to discern. You have to do investigation to find out what that cause was. The interesting stuff comes uh, in the complex area. That the, um, Dave refers a lot to a, a very well-known paper about the failure of complex systems. A complex issue does not have a clear, repeatable correlation between cause and effect. It's typically a combination of causes that have led to an effect, and it needs us to to do further investigation and experimentation, even to identify that relationship. And so these, these blue titles here, this sense, categorize, respond for obvious, this is defining simplistically how you respond. An obvious problem, you see it, you classify what it is, you respond to it. It's complicated, you need to do that analysis before you can respond to it, but it's pretty clear. With complex, it needs to actually be probed and investigated much further. And, and then finally, the other domain that's in, in play here is chaotic, and that's kind of, that is the things that are on fire. As much as anything, your response has to be damage limitation. What we want to do is be able to move things. So if we have a complex issue, we want to do sufficient work that we better understand the cause and effect, and we've constrained, constrained that to the point that we can get it to complicated. I really do recommend um, looking at Dave's website where there's a video. Um, I think this is a great thing to read about anyway because it, it really, again, in the context of that presentation from, Char from Charity Majors yesterday where she talked about the completely unpredictable challenges that are impossible to monitor up front, it was making me think of this again. But what we find is interesting is if we take a swarming approach to this, if we, if we think about how we can organize support around this, we couldn't really do this with tiered support, I don't think, but what we can, if we're willing to be much more dynamic with the way teams and responses are structured, then I think you'll see it maps pretty well. To be honest, if you're in, the, in the 21st century, if you're still involving service desk analysts in depth in an obvious problem, you're probably doing it wrong. We really want to be automating that stuff. So I say service desk, but that's just, Mostly, we want that thing to be a self-service issue. We know the cause, we know the effect, we know how to fix it, no problem. I think complicated problems, remember we have to be able to do analysis before we understand what's causing them, but we expect to find a clear cause. It looks a little bit like our dispatch swarm, I think. You know, these are things that weren't so obvious that the front line fixed them, but a little bit of work can often opportunistically let us fix these things. But then the good thing about swarming is if we do get hold of an issue and these people are working on it and they realize it's not quite so straightforward, then we can easily start building out, building out our little swarm. If we're not having to reassign stuff to people and bounce this ticket around, we can pull in the networks person and the developer because we're not, kind of sh we're not sure how that's going wrong. They can start to gather information. They can come up with theories to test and then Maybe we have two different theories to test so we can break out the assistant swarm person to go and work with the networks person to test one theory while the lead pulls in somebody from Amazon or Azure to work on that side of things and, and, and test those theories. We can start eliminating false leads. We can, we can do all these things that are the, very, are the very heart of a sophisticated investigation. And then maybe once we've done that, we can consolidate down. We've, we've found that it's nothing to do with the network. It's to do with the way our code is running on a cloud environment. And we just need to consolidate that developer and you know, consolidate a team around that developer and around that representative from the cloud company. But the important message here is imagine trying to do that if you've got tiered support and reassignments 
and queues. It, it's just not going to work. And, and I think this is at the heart of the problem and some of the poor performance we see in these complex investigations is that unwillingness to sort of break away from these established structures and just be a lot more dynamic. Or more real, may perhaps more, more often, this is happening anyway, but the processes and tools don't remotely reflect it, so we don't kind of get actionable information for the future. It even works pretty well for the chaotic thing, of course. You know, in, in this case, when something's chaotic, we've probably got a screaming customer. We've probably got to figure out a way of getting around that problem and, and, and getting service restored in the short term while another team goes off and works on the long-term fix. But once again, we can trifurcate, or I was going to say bifurcate, we can, we can set off in different directions without having to worry about some ticket that's bouncing around from team to team. So again, I think it works pretty well. So what, what's next? I mean, why do I come and speak at these conferences? I'm a little out of my comfort zone in a pretty thrilling and educational way, but I was joking yesterday, you know, when I... I love sitting through the technical presentations here, but wow, it's, it's, uh, it's a long way from where I work. But, but I want to at least concede on behalf of service management, we, we haven't necessarily as a community, all of us, properly understood what's happening in the DevOps and Agile world. I think there's a few of us who've tried very, very hard to beat this drum. I've even volunteered this year for the ITIL 4, right? You know, the I, ITIL is being updated, I don't know if you knew. It's, there's a lot of words about, and it's actually set out on the right path to embrace a move away from rigid process definitions and much more of a kind of value stream approach that's much more compatible again with what you do. So I've put my hand up and I'm going to be involved in writing. And I'm pleased to say there's a few of the other people, like you may have seen Rob England, IT skeptic, his, he, he tweets as, he, he's been involved in a lot of, he's effectively jumped the fence completely and gone to work in DevOps. And he's not a person who ever suffered a fad Gladly, so he's he's involved, and and of course because of people like Gene Kim looking the other way and sort of pointing out, you know, there's actually a lot of stuff that ITSM should be doing for us and needs to do for us. What we've got to do is evolve, and I hope we're showing that we are thinking about how we can break a lot of old structures and, and change. To do that, we have to maintain this dialogue. I mean, it's brilliant coming here. I always talk to people. I'm always happy to hear. You know, if, if you just having a, t <laughs> if you feel that what you're doing is completely incompatible with your company's existing support systems, then you know we can have a private conversation. It doesn't matter. If, to, you know, uh, these things stay with us. It just helps us to learn what's happening. Because this last line is really important. You've got your company's ears. You, you, the DevOps movement in general. You know, the agile infrastructure movement, all, all the things you've been doing and building are getting bigger and bigger in enterprises. CIOs read that state of DevOps report and they see these huge, huge numbers in terms of better success, faster development. And they're paying a lot of attention. So, so you've got a really good opportunity to kind of push back against stuff that doesn't work. And I think the best way we can do that is to do that constructively and, and you know, make these things work in future. Because the last thing I want is to sort of see the people I... I work with and talk with in big companies, in DevOps type teams, sort of getting sucked into, into these problems. And I, I already sadly see it happening. I, I spoke with someone last year who said now 50% of their time when they should be developing is just spent trying to kind of chase customer tickets and, and, and deal with them. And it, it's not working for them. So we've got a really good chance to make things better. Um, and that's why we're going to keep yeah, that's why it's been really great engaging with the DevOps community and, and trying to kind of push things forward on our side. So I'll just close off. There's a few things I'd recommend reading. Um, the cons I've, again, I'll tweet these links. I should already have done, actually, unless I, I always get my time zones on Buffer mixed up, even when it's an hour's time zone. So I've either tweeted them now or they'll be out at about one in the morning. But uh, the Consortium for Service Innovation page is worth a, is worth a read. The KCS, the KCS stuff's good as well about knowledge management, but just for now, I'd, I'd suggest taking a look at that. Um, Dave Snowden, Ken Evan, his, his Cognitive Edge website's great. There's a podcast called Boss Level Podcast where he did a, he did a long interview about Ken Evan and astronomy and all sorts of things, but it's got the best 10-minute summary you'll ever get of Ken Evan, so that's worth looking forward to. 
And then finally, I've actually got a, I've got a blog that I wrote a couple of years ago, which is which went huge. It got you know it, it got a lot of positive feedback from the DevOps community, and it is basically detailing this deconstruction of how three tier support is such a bad thing for DevOps, uh, and how we can do things better. So hopefully, this has been interesting. I know it's a little a little off topic at a very technical conference, but this is a conference that actually I owe a lot to. So I'm I'm really happy to have come back and you know, being able to contribute something. So thank you very much. <laughs>